second side of the aisle to acknowledge the mathematical problem. Uh, I, I know you're reading, you're talking for no, 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 When, 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 when I, I interviewed, hang on, I'm going to answer your question. question. When I interviewed, I think they had ideas, but they were bad ideas. They were bad ideas for America. Senator, uh, uh, we're a little off topic. I have to let Senator Obama respond to that. Because that just doesn't... i what the facts are. Rick, again, you had the Rick, word, you I'm speaking, I'm paper, speaking, the I'm speaking. Hello and welcome to UCTV Politics. I'm your moderator, Rebecca Greenberg, and our debate tonight will cover U.S. economic policy. The debaters are Cameron Wilcox, representing the Republican Party, and Bennett Cognato, representing the Democratic Party. As per debate rules, Bennett will get the first question. Campaign finance reform has been a rather contentious topic in recent decades, but this particular election has conjured up many concerns about where and from who candidates are receiving money. Donald Trump has proudly proclaimed throughout his campaign that he is self-funding his presidential run. Bernie Sanders says he wants to ban billionaires like conservative moguls Charles and David Koch from influencing the outcome of elections. Sanders has called for public financing of campaigns, which means candidates would get tax dollars to spend on their efforts, but wouldn't be allowed to raise and spend money otherwise. The Federal Election Commission is said to be dysfunctional despite being the watchdog for campaign finance violations. How do you think the FEC shapes the campaign finance landscape and how could it be improved? Sure, well that's a great question. I just want to start by saying thanks to Casey and Tony, Cameron and, and Becca, uh, yourself uh, for being here tonight. Um, I, I do think that the, the Federal Election Commission can play a bigger role. I think currently we're seeing a lot of gridlock there. Um, but we, we need to do something I think to be able to to change the, the way current uh, campaign financing happens, and that, that it's kind of happening in this NASCAR-style uh, way of candidates having to represent the interests of their donors in their campaigns, and I think it's a really big issue. I mean, if you look at um, the New York Times reporting that the Koch brothers are getting ready to spend $889 million on the 2016 elections, I think you have to consider what it is that they see as being so valuable in those elections, and I think it's the fact that policy changes people's lives, and I think if we can focus the, the formation of that policy and the candidates that are shaping that policy back to the people um, and have that be publicly financed, I think that's the, the best option for democracy. Thank you. Uh, I think when you look at the whole topic of campaign finance, uh, you need to first address the dark money that sits and fuels most of the campaigns. Um, and I think you need to look at it in areas where uh, entities like unions dominate campaigns over everyday people and we need to pass laws like those in Montana that uh, have full disclosure for all types of dark money. Um, we also need to institute tax credit plans like Virginia where their first $500 donations from everyday people are covered um, and we also need to protect these people and make sure that there's no retribution for their donations because we have to make sure overall that we bring this back to the people because the people should have a say more than large entities such as the unions. Sure, yeah, I think we uh, would mostly agree that, that uh, the financing of elections is more of an American issue than it is a Democratic or uh, conservative issue. Um, I think those kind of uh, disclosures are important to make sure we have transparency in that system. Um, and the more we can start moving towards public financing of uh, campaigns, the less we'll see this control by big money in politics. Well, on to the next question. In July, Hillary Clinton said the following, referring to the Republican Party. There's just a pattern here where the other side continues to use the same old tired policies. They don't work, and then Democratic presidents have to come in and fix what was broken. If you look at the evidence at the end of Bill Clinton's two terms, we had the longest peacetime expansion in American history, with 22 million new jobs, a balanced budget, and a surplus that would have paid off our national debt had they not been so rudely interrupted by the next administration. David Kamen, a Clinton campaign advisor, argued that the boom in the 1990s was the direct result of policies advanced by Bill Clinton in a particular 1993 budget deficit plan that attracted no Republican votes. Moreover, he said the shift from budget surpluses to budget deficits in the 2000s was not inevitable and it was the direct result of policy choices made by the George W. Bush administration. In your opinion, is there a GOP presidential candidate that could seemingly disrupt this pattern and pay off our national debt? Well, I think that when you look at a race this early on, on both sides start to find a candidate that actually has come out with a full plan. However, I do believe that Marco Rubio currently stands alone, in my opinion, as to having a full plan that might be able to help reduce the national budget over time. I think when you look at the budget overall, you see that there's a lot of misuse of funds. 
uh, in all areas, be it defense or um, in cash welfare programs. I think, for example, we have a very outdated system in the fact that we need to require minimum work hours for programs such as adult food stamps for able-bodied workers, of course, and things like that where it has tripled the amount of spending we've done in uh, the past few years. If we were able to go in and make sure that these programs are spending the necessary amount and getting the necessary citizens the aid, we could save large amounts of money. We could also go back to things such as the Department of Defense. If we updated all of the military equipment and found the best ways to look at the logistics there, we could save a lot of money by using what we need and making sure that we have the most up-to-date information rather than overspending and making and misusing funds and just making the budget blow up. If we make sure that it's balanced in all areas, we would have a much better chance of reducing the budget. And I believe Marco Rubio's plan encompasses all the necessary parts. Sure. Uh, I, I would disagree. Uh, terms of Marco Rubio specifically. I mean, I think you see him and, and a majority of a Republican Party, maybe besides um, Rand Paul or, or a few others that would speak largely against spending, you know, that, that are want to give the military things that they're not asking for, um, are, aren't in favor of, uh, you know, restructuring our health care system, which I think is important, especially if you look at uh, sort of the way the GOP worked through the George W. Bush administration. I mean, we put wars on credit cards and, and tax cuts and things like that. So I think we do need to take a balanced approach to how we increase our revenue and cut spending. Um, but I don't believe any of the GOP candidates are the answer to that. Well, I think that when you look at that, I understand that uh, from a liberal point of view, looking at the conservatives and perhaps their defense spending, uh, the, that aspect of it, it can be, uh, it can make some uh, hesitation on that side, but I believe that when you look at the current situation uh, geopolitically across the world, um, to say that we need to spend less on defense spending seems a little ridiculous due to the current situation, especially what's happened in the past couple of weeks. I think that there are a lot of other areas we can look into the budget, such as the Highway Trust Fund, and make sure that um, our funds are being spent properly. And I think we need a candidate that can focus on what we can do back home while also securing our interests overseas. Well, we're just getting started here on UCTV's Political Debate Show. Stay tuned for more after this quick commercial break. So what exactly is the undergraduate student government? Who are we? The undergraduate student government is composed of five standing committees. Those committees are made up of elected senators and committee members. They are academic affairs, external affairs, funding board, student development, and student services. Every other week, senators meet to vote on issues pertaining to students. We are the only student organization in which every member is elected by you. We have allocated about a million dollars towards student initiatives this year. We organize discussions on sexual assault awareness. We work to stop a $400 housing fee increase to make tuition more affordable for the student body. We worked with the Student Recreational Facility and UITS to get Wi-Fi installed in the gym. We met with both major party candidates for lieutenant governor and asked about their support for the next generation connect. We established a student committee to tell the administration what the students wanted to be put in the new recreation facility. We got the library hours back at 2 a.m. and set plans to expand a 24 hour study space. As students ourselves, we're here to understand your wants and needs, and we're here to ensure that you own your UConn experience. USG is always here with you, facilitating a better UConn community. Students today, Huskies forever. And we're back. The next question goes to Bennett. In the fourth GOP debate, the candidates were asked if they would raise the minimum wage. Trump, Carson, and Rubio all said they would not raise it. The three candidates said that they believe raising the minimum wage would increase unemployment. They said that lower wages encourages people to work harder to reach that, quote, upper stratum, as Trump called it. Carson said that in order for people to ascend the ladder of opportunity, we cannot raise minimum wages and keep them dependent. Do you agree with these assertions? Uh, no. Uh, I think they've got it all wrong uh, when they talk about the minimum wage and, and having more jobs, paying decent wages being bad uh, for, for our culture, our economy. It just do doesn't make any sense. I mean, we've got to face the facts that 47 million Americans are living in poverty today. Um, massive wealth and income inequality um, are, that exists today. We've, we've got to make sure that if someone's working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, that they're making enough money to survive, really. I mean, 
if you look at a fifteen dollar minimum wage, it's it's not something that's entirely unreasonable. You know, in nineteen sixty five, the CEO to worker pay was twenty to one, and in two thousand thirteen, it was at two hundred and ninety five to one. So we've got to make sure that if a mother, a single mother's got to pay ten dollars an hour for a babysitter, that she's making at least ten dollars an hour where she's working, um, and that we support all workers in America uh, to have wages that are going to allow them to, to have a decent quality of life. I think when you look at this, it's a very interesting topic in the way that the way all think tanks in Washington nowadays are biased, every study you look at is going to give you a different result as to what the end result of raising the minimum wage would be. However, I would not in any way, shape, or form raise the minimum wage if I had the opportunity. When I look at it, two examples come to my mind. The first being uh, the, state, the city of San Francisco. San Francisco is a great example for this because if you look at it, they had the highest minimum wage in the country for years. They also have the nation's highest rate of unemployment. I also think that when you look at minimum wages, sure, it's nice to assume that large companies have the money in their pockets to pay these people. But when you look at a company that has maybe five employees, if they have to raise to a $15 minimum wage, that's around $77,000 more a year that they have to spend. And that, for small companies, can be the difference between living in a shed or a shelter outside or living in their home. Because small businesses cannot handle that type of raise on their businesses. And we I think that's have something. to switch over to Bennett. What, what do you say in response? Sure. Well, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the small business part. And I think there are great ways to make sure that our tax structure is progressive and that small businesses have the tax cuts uh, that they need to be able to make wages work. But I also think it's important to look at it from this Republican idea of the way business is supposed to work. If you look at business models and things like that, if, you're, if your business model doesn't account to pay your employees a fair wage, then to me that doesn't say that that's a very susceptible or viable business model. So I think we've got to make sure that our American policy focuses on fair wages first. All right, moving on to the next question. During last Tuesday's debate, the candidates spoke about the widening gap between the rich and everyone else. Rand Paul put partial blame on Democrats, but also on the Federal Reserve. Paul said that by artif artificially keeping interest rates below the market rate, average citizens find it difficult to earn interest and make money. According to Paul, because the country is paying interest for big banks in New York to keep money in those banks, much of that money has not been filtered out into the economy. He also asserted that the Federal Reserve destroys the value of currency. Do you believe that the Federal Reserve is the root cause of income equality? Uh, well, when you look at it, honestly, uh, as a Republican, it actually is rare for me to find someone where I agree with Rand Paul. Um, however, I do hear, and I think that um, the Federal Reserve itself needs to be uh, a lot more transparent in talking about what goes on, the directors' meetings, as a collection of banks underneath it, they need to allow the United States citizens to see what's going on inside these meetings. Um, I think we need, as a country, with the Federal Reserve, we need to stop printing money as an escape route for everything because it does devalue the dollar. And I believe that we must implement laws that lead to the transparency um, with the Federal Reserve and also set regulations for how much money they can print because so far those regulations, if any, are in place are outdated, not working, and you're seeing the value of the dollar go down due to it. And I think that we also need to set strict regulations for what they can do with the interest rates because having them artificially low is only going to cause more problems in the future. Uh, you know, I think Rand Paul really uh, brings up this issue as the Federal Reserve in a way to kind of avoid talking about the minimum wage and income inequality. And I think that's unfortunate, um, especially when you see the way that this sort of um, income inequality is working systemically now when you've got you know, the average woman making 78 cents to a man's dollar and you look at uh, 64 cents for women of color and 54 cents for Latino women. I mean, the Federal Reserve can set monetary policy to, to adjust for inflation and things like that, but I, I wouldn't say that they're responsible for income inequality. Um, I think that when you look at it as a whole, I think it ties into a lot of issues. I think the Federal Reserve is just another example of how our government nowadays likes to forgive and forget rather than have people actually own up to or see what's going on and pay for it. It goes on to the way that what I said earlier in that programs such as welfare are wasting money and things are, it's not being strict enough to make sure that the right money, the right types, and the right interest rates are going to the right people. I think that it's just such a loose system right now. There's just another example of how lax our government administration is currently with letting money go and letting the value of the dollar suffer to make sure that everyone's equal or happy in the eyes of this current administration. And now we're going to take another commercial break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I will always want you. I came in like a wrecking
And we're back. The next question goes to Bennett. During Saturday's Democratic presidential debate, Sanders said that Clinton's plan to reign on Wall Street is not good enough. He said the fact that she takes campaign contributions from Wall Street means she won't be tough against the banks. Sanders spoke about the Glass-Steagall Act, which was passed in 1933 after the Great Depression and prohibited commercial banks from participating in the investment banking business. Sanders said that the consolidation of such incredible power and wealth means that the only answer is to break up the big banks. Do you agree with Sanders' belief that in order for there to be Wall Street reform, the big banks must be broken up? Um, I think it, it, it's a big component that needs to be addressed. I think uh, either Democratic candidate is going to do um, a lot more than the Republican side in terms of reigning in Wall Street. Um, you know, when you've got these big banks controlling all this money, investing in the stock market, um, you know, they become these too big to fail entities that really, as Bernie Sanders says, should be too big to exist, really. And I think he's had a lot of great proposals, one of them I know being uh, to, to allow post offices to have mo uh, like modest banking services for low income individuals. I think it's important that we break up those big banks that are investing that money um, in the stock market and bring that money back into local economies and local banks um, and, and make sure that that money isn't, you know, playing into big political interests. I, I actually like the term too big to fail. I think it's interesting. I believe that's what America was founded on. The American dream itself is to make yourself too big to fail, to achieve your dreams to succeed. And I understand that big banks, in a way, most people can see them as a way to hinder themselves and to bring them down because of the way that they're such large entities. But I think actually it's a model of success in capitalism and how well it can work that if you work hard and you put the effort in, you can see that the success will come to you. I mean, yes, these big banks are taking money and reinvesting it, but isn't that what we want? Isn't we, don't we want a country of people that can raise capital and can reuse it into our economy and continue to build things? I don't see a problem with that personally. Uh, so I, I would disagree. I think when you talk about too big to fail, I think you're saying that it's too big to fail because of you know, the money that it controls in terms of these individual people who've invested their money in these banks. So just because they're too big to fail doesn't mean they won't fail. It means that when they do fail, you know, it's going to be the taxpayers that are going to be paying millions and billions of dollars to bail out these banks. So I don't think that's, that's a weight that should fall onto taxpayers. And I think the only way to really prevent something like that happening uh, is to make sure that these banks aren't that big, really. Uh, the United States gives upwards of $30 billion annually in foreign aid. Although this is only 1% of the federal budget, it is the highest in the world. Senator Cruz said in 2013 that we need to stop sending foreign aid to nations that hate us, like Egypt, for example. Cruz has said time and again that he supports military intervention in his approach to foreign policy. Conversely, Bernie Sanders voted to annex over $150 million from the U.S. military budget to the International Monetary Fund to help establish funding for very poor and, undebted, and indebted countries like Sudan and Somalia. Do you believe that America should be allocating or reducing its money to military intervention in our approach towards foreign aid? I think it's very important that we stated that it's 1% of the national budget. Most people when polled believe that it's between 15 to 20%, so I think it's important to get the real statistic out there. Um, I also think that, yes, $30 billion is the most in the world that's spent on foreign aid, but it's also important to note that compared to the ratio of the actual national budget, it's a very small amount compared to other countries that the United States gives to federal aid. That being said, I think there's only three reasons that the United States should give aid to other countries, those being health initiatives such as HIV and AIDS in countries such as our continent, such as Africa, rather, um, allies, and I mean strong allies, not allies we want to make, I think strong allies such as Israel such as NATO members. I think it's also important that we look at nations in parts of the world where we can help spread democracy, help spread American ideals, and we can use foreign aid there to help them become less vulnerable and help economic development. I think that, yes, there are tons of places throughout the world that could use foreign aid and could use help. But as a country, as a government, the United States has the duty to protect American interests, to spread American interests, and make sure that the money we spend helps the American people. I understand wanting to help all Sorry, those in the world. Sure. Well, I mean, I understand, uh, you know, the, the argument about being able to protect American interests. I think, you know, we're kind of talking about separate things when we talk about foreign aid and military spending. Uh, but I, I, I do I do agree that, that it, within, within our best interest as a country to sort of use our strength and ability um, to help resolve international conflicts and things like that, um, to help address uh, global poverty and global disease and things like that. Uh, but, I, but I wouldn't agree to the extent of, of pushing American interests on, on countries that have no interest in them. Um, I think we've got to make sure that it's responsible and, and uh, 
conservative in a sense. Well, I mean, obviously you take into account whether or not the money being spent would work within those countries. But I also think it's important that we as a nation, the world looks to us to donate these things. I think it's important that we start initiatives to get other countries to. As Mitt Romney said, we borrow money from China to go help other countries when we should be getting initiatives to get China to just spend the money themselves. We shouldn't be borrowing money from other countries to go help other countries. If we form initiatives and educate so that other countries do the donating themselves, we can spend the money on the right type of interests and America can go back to helping its citizens rather than being the world's uh, source for money and aid no matter what country it's going to. So that brings us to the end of the questions. Each debater will now have one minute to present their closing statements. Cameron? Well, I think overall when you look at economic policy in this country, uh, within the national budget, we need to make sure that we are using funds and we are balancing the budget. We have to stop the extreme misuse of funds and the overspending just to make programs work or just to make sure that everyone gets as much money as they want. I also think we need to have accountability with things such as the Federal Reserve. Um, and campaign finance reform with disclosure and we need to have more initiatives to get people involved and give the power back to the everyday people and make sure that the big entities such as unions aren't necessarily dominating campaign finance. I think when it comes to foreign aid, we need to make sure that we are supporting the right allies. We are supporting the people that will help us. We are spreading American interests and we are protecting this nation as best as we can. I think that overall education is very important when it comes to economic policies and I would like to end by saying thank you to UCTV, specifically Tony and Casey for having me on, uh, compliment uh, Becca on a great job debating tonight and I would just like to end by saying God bless America. Thank you, Bennett. Mm, sure. Uh, well, I think when we talk about uh, democratic uh, economic policy, I think we've really got to start by talking about like I said before, the 47 million Americans that are living in po uh, poverty currently, the rampant wealth and income inequality that Americans face every day uh, in the workplace. And I think when we talk about democratic uh, economic policy, we also got to talk about being able to invest in education, uh, in infrastructure, in jobs programs, making sure you know that when we've got an African-American teenage unemployment rate of close to 50%, that we're making sure that we're investing in jobs and infrastructure um, and providing uh, to, to raise these people out of poverty. Um, we've also got to make sure that we've got wages that work uh, for the American people. Um, so that when we've got, you know, like I said before, you know, a single mother that's got to pay $10 an hour to a babysitter, that she can make more than $10 an hour at her job, wherever that is. And that we don't devalue the work of the American people, uh, whether it's through our wages, um, through trade deals and things like that. We've really got to make sure that we protect uh, American interests here um, through democratic economic policy. So I also uh, want to say thank you to UCTV for hosting the debate, uh, as well as uh, Tony and Casey, um, Becca, as well as Cameron for being here tonight. Um, and, uh, and also throughout the, uh, the God Bless America, uh, let's make sure that uh, we focus again on jobs and raising people out of poverty, um, investing in education. Thank you. Well, that does it for us tonight. I just want to thank Cameron and Bennett for being here, it was a great debate, and we will have more to come following Thanksgiving break. For now, I'm Rebecca Greenberg, and this is UCTV Politics. Good night.